Um, it's a real honour to be here. It sounds like Philip Geddes was a young man who was a journalist to the core, someone who just couldn't help but investigate the story, find the angle, tragically, even in the face of terrible danger. It's a real credit to him that more than three decades after his death, he's still remembered for what he achieved and that this prize seeks out people with that same thirst for breaking news. So congratulations, Alice and Ella. How exciting that you've got a political cartoonist winning one of the prizes these year, um, this year. It's funny, when we came in the door here to Rhodes House, I hadn't heard of it before, but I remembered it and I realised we'd been here once before for a wedding. And actually, Toby, my husband, was the best man and gave a speech from here. Um, you'll be pleased to know I've had a few um, less glasses of wine, or fewer glasses of wine, shall we say, tonight. Um, Philip matriculated at Teddy Hall back in 1977, arguably just a generation ago. But if I could teleport us all back there right now so we could have a little nosy wander around the college, I think we'd be pretty shocked. And I'm not just talking about the 70s flares and the dodgy haircuts, or by the people smoking in cinemas. I think the thing that we would find most surprising about 1977 at Teddy Hall would be the total lack of women. Because back then, Teddy Hall was a boys' club. They may as well have hung a sign on the Porter's Lodge door that said, ladies need not apply. The good news that you all know is that things started to change. In fact, while Philip was at the college, a year later, he joined an all-male college and he left a mixed college. In 1978, Elizabeth Butler became the first woman um, as a female student at Teddy Hall. Hooray for progress. And the even better news, she started a trend. So seeing as we're in a time machine, let's fast forward back to the present, 37 years later. And as you all know, this academic year, you've had the 3,000th woman at Teddy Hall. And Keith, I'm particularly pleased that you asked me to talk during this celebration because I might have hit on a bugbear of mine. As you can see, there is a theme that I would like to cover here. And that is women breaking into institutions where they were previously not all that welcome. I happen to work inside one. It's called the British Parliament. Now, the most important group of people in there, the ones that I'm going to focus my main argument on today, are the MPs. And they really do still have a job to do when it comes to women. But this is a journalism lecture. I assume that there are people here who would like to work on newspapers, lots who do, um, perhaps some who work in television. So let me start with my world, the reporters. And I'm sorry if this section is something that a lot of you know a lot about. Um, I don't know who knows what, so I just thought I'd tell you a bit about the context of journalism in Parliament. We all have a special pass, the lobby pass. It gives us access to the Palace of Westminster so that we can cover the government from very, very close quarters. And we're based inside Parliament in grubby little newspaper offices piled high with papers along a corridor nicknamed the Burma Road. But don't ask me why. Despite my journalistic instincts, I've still not quite figured it out. Collectively, we are known as the lobby. Now, I've worked in the lobby, as Keith said, for The Observer, for The Times, for Sky News, and now as political editor of The Guardian. I have just come off maternity leave into the job. This is the end of my first week, so excuse me if I look a little frazzled. It's been quite a full-on week. And the reason I'm here on a working day is, as you pointed out, that I'm doing this as a job share. Today, Heather Stewart is in the hot seat back in Parliament. She's also a mum, and actually, this job share is quite unusual. It's been a, quite a big step for The Guardian, so I'll come to that. But first, let me tell you about my initial impressions of the lobby. I joined it seven years ago, and I think I felt it was a bit like a cross between a beery working man's club and a posh public school. 
there were quite a lot of plummy accents, <laughs> maybe mine too. People drank a lot. I only had to roll 30 yards across a landing from my desk to the nearest bar. Handy, I guess. Everyone needs a drink once in a while. And it felt a bit like a club with rules that you really need to understand. Like the fact that on some corridors, if you bump into an MP, you can quote what they say. But if you're in another corridor and you bump into the same MP, you've got to be careful because that corridor is off the record. You can quote the information, just don't say their name. Um, so lots of rules that you needed to understand and lots of corridors that you need to figure out. Parliament is a bit of a labyrinth. There's none of the glamour of the West Wing. Twice every day, one of our team has to navigate their way up through the twisting corridors to the top corner of the palace where we would sit shivering in a cold room, listen to the daily briefings of the Prime Minister's official spokesperson. And I say person because, excitingly, for the first time ever, it is a woman, the extremely talented Helen Bauer. From our offices, you can also walk straight into the gallery of the House of Commons chamber, where you can watch the MPs debate in person from above. Now, there's lots and lots of interesting stuff that goes on in there, but I'm sure you can imagine that the gallery is fullest every Wednesday at noon for our political weekly Punch and Judy show, Jezza versus Cam at PMQs. And as I watch it from above, it's a bit like watching it from up there, I get quite a different view of PMQs than you might. Um, I can sort of watch the two leaders spar it out over all the bald patches of the many male MPs. <laughs> now, after those very busy sessions like PMQs or like in a couple of weeks, we're going to have the budget, the journalists and the special advisors who sit on either side of the gallery watching their bosses, well, we all pile out into a little room behind the chamber and we have what we call huddles, which is basically a briefing in which journalists literally huddle around the advisors with our notebooks in hand, scribbling quickly, firing off questions, trying to get beneath the story. Because you might have noticed politicians tend to use rather bland language and often they want their advisors to tell you what they really meant to say. So those briefings are really important. I mean, they're the type of things that give you the stories that you see in the newspaper where it says Downing Street sources or people close to Jeremy Corbyn. You know, that's what's going on behind the scenes um, in the chamber. And one thing that can be quite difficult for women who have children is it does feel like a lot of business in Parliament takes place after hours business discussed policies or stories over drinks or dinners in the evening because a lot of the votes go on very late into the night. Now, hanging around Strangers Bar in search of a scoop was all very well when I was in my late 20s and childless. But I've got to be honest, it's frankly less appealing now that I want to get home to my husband and my two little boys, which is perhaps one of the reasons why the lobby is not a great advert for female journalists. In fact, there are a lot of men. When I first started, it felt like each of the newspaper rooms would have their only token women, woman, sorry, often in a fairly junior role, often asked to take on the women-y stories. You ever notice the bylines about, you know, what Samantha Cameron was wearing? That's the token woman who usually <coughs> writes that story. So great that The Guardian now has not just one, but two women running the political coverage. But in some ways, I think it does highlight just how bad things have been. I mean, it turns out that Heather and I are the first ever female political editors on a daily broadsheet. The Sunday papers have had women, although some of the most high profile have left those positions. Isabel Oakeshott at the Sunday Times, Gabby Hinsliff at The Observer, and more recently, Jane Merrick stepping down at The Independent on Sunday. And still as women, we are really the minority 
in the lobby with yet more mothers walking away in recent months. I often feel like there's a block at a certain level. Women's progress seems to stall as they start to have children and the men start to get those big promotions. And let me be frank, being a political editor is not that family friendly. The pressure and the expectations are really, really high. I mean, I know that from this week. I mean, every day, the pressure to write the front page story. It's not a surprise that neither Heather nor I wanted to go into the role alone. She's also got two young kids. And after week one, I still think that even as a share, this is going to be quite a tough gig for us. Take yesterday, I went to Amiens, uh, where I got to ask President Hollande about the consequences of Brexit. I asked David Cameron if he thought that this election was a complete stitch up and they were, you know, persuading foreign leaders to intervene in the debate. He told me this was not a David Icke style conspiracy. I got home and I saw the responses to the questions I had asked on the 10 o'clock news. Exciting stuff. But look, the early start and the late finish meant I didn't see my children from Wednesday breakfast until Friday breakfast, in which time my baby Rory began to crawl for the first time. Can you imagine the guilt that I felt when I saw that this morning? I could honestly do an entire lecture series on a mother's guilt, but I don't have time to do that now, so I'll leave that for another time. But look, a job share is radical in this kind of role. It is different. Kath Viner, the political editor of The Guardian, is sticking her neck out. There were lots of naysayers, lots of scepticism, even a very close friend of mine who had worked in the lobby, a woman, someone I would call a feminist. She said to me before I got the role, you'd be mad to take it. You cannot divide that job. There's simply too much pressure, too many decisions. Who's going to make them? I said, maybe we could collaborate, you know, give it a go. We'll see. Um, and I hope to prove her wrong. But the truth is, we did also get quite a lot of support, even from male political editors. Dads, you know, they want to have a work-life balance too. One male colleague said to me, even if it fails, it's important that we try it out because otherwise we're just not going to get women in the lobby. And even men in the lobby are despairing about that fact. So Heather and I are determined to make this work because otherwise mums simply won't do this job. And that would be a problem because the gender mix matters. Working in the lobby is hugely important. It really is a privilege. We get so close to where the decisions that affect all of our lives are taking place. And I like to think of us as a window into those decisions. A window into the institution where people are making the policies that actually you know, affect everything that we all do. So if we are unrepresentative, then what does that mean? It means the people who hold the government to account are not necessarily in touch with the views of a broad section of the population. Well, actually, half the population. And that's an issue, because I believe that as a woman, at times I do have a different outlook to men. Different subjects fire me up. I have different priorities. You just need to ask my husband um, to know that that is true. And research suggests that FTSE boards most bal balanced by gender perform best. Well, I think more women in the lobby will mean better political journalism and a wider reach. But if we are talking about representation, then we need to talk about other things as well. Ethnicity. If I'm in the minority as a woman, well, I am a rare species as a non-white woman. But even that isn't the biggest problem, in my opinion. We are the journalists in the lobby, journalists more widely, actually, terribly skewed when it comes to socioeconomic background. I may tick more than one box, but I'm hardly 
breaking the mould when, as Keith pointed out, I have a middle class upbringing, private schooling and a Cambridge degree. And there's way too much of that in journalism and particularly in the lobby. So that's the journalism. I mean, I could talk more about my experiences. Do ask me about that later. But I want to move on to the thing that I want to focus on. And that's the MPs. <laughs> now, in some ways, they were way ahead of you at Teddy Hall. The first female MP was elected to Westminster back in 1918, nearly 100 years ago. It's not been so great since then. In fact, it's been more like a trickle to Teddy Hall's flood. You've got 3,000 women through the doors in 37 years. In Parliament, just 450 in close to a century. There are more men sitting in Parliament today than there are women who have ever sat in the British Parliament. 459 men elected in 2015 alone, which is interesting because many people saw last year's election as a great success in gender terms. And it's true, we had a record high when it came to women, 191 MPs. But just hold fire before we break out the champagne and, and also just let me get a glass of water. 191 MPs, that is 29% of the total. A big improvement, one female journalist who was a political writer years ago told me that when she used to stand in members' lobby where you meet the MPs coming out of the chamber and you try and grab them and you ask them about a story, she felt that it was a bit like prostitution. It doesn't feel like that now, but still, it's not even a third of MPs in 2016. Don't get me started on top cabinet posts. And even that has been achieved with one of the main parties, the Labour Party, using really controversial positive discrimination. All women shortlists. Constituency parties often do not like them. And then if we look at the Conservatives, who are trying mm, softer methods to boost the number of women, the proportion is more like 20%, so just one in five. And while they did boost female numbers last year, even Baroness Jenkin, very impressive peer who runs the Tories Women to Win, put a lot of it down to luck. Some of those women MPs were selected for seats where the party, frankly, did not expect to win. They didn't expect to take Ed Ball's seat. They didn't expect to take Vince Cable's seat. So those two women, they, you know, they're just a boost. They weren't people who were expecting to come in with the methods that they were using. And all of this is a problem because I would argue that the lack of women in politics isn't just unfair, it's extremely damaging. Parliament is not a normal workplace. If it is unrepresentative, then its ability to make good policy is narrowed and weakened, in my opinion. I've seen the impact of more women. They've shifted the subjects, the focus, the tone of Parliament. Those women who first arrived through those Labour shortlists back in 1997, 101 Labour MPs, patronisingly dubbed Blair's babes, they drove domestic violence up the agenda. They changed discrimination laws. They shone a light on the lack of progress on equal pay. They improved maternity rights. You know, I've just benefited from that. And you might not believe it, but I think they even slightly improved the behaviour in the chamber. There were even more insults before 1997. Actually, I say that. One MP told me that when she joined Parliament in 2010 and sat down in the chamber for her first day in a skirt, which apparently was a mistake, a man from the opposite benches screamed knickers at her. So maybe the uh, behaviour in the chamber is never going to improve. Now look, some people say to me, stop. These shouldn't be women's issues. Men should be talking about them too. Well, of course, men should be talking about them too. I'm one of the people who would argue that. But I do think we have to have a reality check with where we are right now. And I'm sure men do care about these issues. I mean, it's great to see so many men 
come to a lecture that's very clearly about promoting women in Parliament. But with all due respect, it was not John Prescott, not Jack Straw, not even Tony Blair heading up the fights that I was talking about. It was women, people like Harriet Harman and Yvette Cooper. And I spoke to Yvette about this lecture and she suggested that I give you another example of the impact of that huge improvement in the gender balance back in 1997, childcare. You know, this was an issue that had been largely overlooked in Parliament for many, many years. I mean, perhaps not surprisingly, you know, the historical model of work in this country was man, breadwinner, woman, mum. And I suspect that not all, but lots of the male MPs in the 60s, 70s and 80s had wives at home who looked after their children full time. Now, by 1997, that was shifting. But in order to move women into work in larger numbers requires childcare. It's obvious, yeah? But it's a point that means for the scores of women arriving in Parliament in that year, some of them who had children, others who hoped to become mothers, childcare was a priority because it was an issue they were thinking about and experiencing. So it was a bigger priority for them, I suspect, than a lot of the men who had preceded them. And that Labour government drove childcare up the agenda. They made it a significant part of the tax system for the first time. And Yvette would argue that that same group of women also were pretty useful in working out when government got it wrong on gender. She reminded me of how female MPs like her, when she was a backbencher, noticed a government policy to pay family tax credits to the main earner. Well, the main earner was disproportionately men. So they were worried about the impact on women. Those female MPs lobbied their Treasury ministers and they got that changed. You see, women can often hold up a gendered lens on government policy with great results. They know how it might affect women because they are women. <laughs> it's quite simple, really. Now, Yvette put in a parliamentary question back in 1999 about the early budgets of New Labour. And what she found is they'd had a disproportionately positive impact on women. You may remember that she did the same exercise in 2010, then as Shadow Work and Pension Secretary. And she found that the first budgets of the Conservative Lib Dem coalition had a disproportionately negative impact on women. Now, some of that is an inevitable impact of austerity. Women are larger users of public services. They were always likely to be disproportionately hit. But Labour also highlighted in that government how tax credits were hitting women harder and how pensions were particularly affecting, uh, pension reforms were particularly affecting a group of women in their 50s. And they managed to change some of those policies. And look, it wasn't just Labour who were worried about that. It was the 57 female Tory MPs who we welcomed to Parliament back in 2010. Still just 17% of the party, but real progress for the Conservatives. And I know a lot of those MPs, and back then they weren't in policy-making positions, they were new backbenchers, but they were concerned that their ministers, most of whom were men, were making mistakes that might cost the party female votes. They too wanted to put government policy through a gendered lens, and they actually set something up called the Conservative Women's Forum. Now, lots of them are ministers. Some are sitting around the cabinet table. And I think that once again, we see the tilting that the gender balance is having. It's really having quite a big impact. I mean, these days we have Conservative ministers talking about female genital mutilation. They didn't used to talk about that, trust me. And some of them are working with Labour colleague, colleagues on protections around abortion, around other issues that might affect women more, childcare. But look, this isn't about stereotyping. Those same women are also talking about defence, about policing, about the economy, about sport. Look at someone like Andrea Ledson, MP. Here is a woman who was a senior director at Barclays, an outspoken Eurosceptic, particularly at the moment, who quickly became a member of the Treasury Select Committee, 
grilling George Osborne, famously telling him to F off when he tried to persuade her to vote against a call for an EU referendum back in 2011. Seems she'd got the uh, feeling right on the EU referendum. Well, he forgave her. She became city minister in his department and she's now an energy minister with a female boss, Amber Rudd. Now, Andrea is also a mum and someone who through that experience has led sex education debates in parliament, has set up charities that are supposed to focus on the way in which new parents bond with their newborn babies. It's an issue she's been able to place in front of the prime minister. She's also a mum who has to cope with parliament, which is quite a difficult thing to do at times. She used to tell me that when she got a vote, and I should explain, a bell rings, you get a text message, you've got eight minutes to get to the chamber. And as soon as that eight minutes is done, they lock the doors and all the MPs have to vote. And they have to vote because their whips need them in there to get the results. What Andrea used to do is go to her flat in Westminster. She used to sit on her daughter's bed. She used to read her a bedtime story, but on her feet were a pair of trainers and in her right arm, behind her, so that her daughter couldn't see that she was distracted, was her Blackberry. And as soon as that text message came in, she would say, night, night, put the Blackberry down, leg it, down seven um, sets of stairs, across two roads, into Parliament and into Chamber, just in eight minutes before the door shut. And that just gives you an example of some of the practicalities that might face you, particularly if you're a mum. I was talking with Professor Gull about some of the practicalities perhaps for women academics. Well, there are lots for women MPs, you know. Should there be electronic voting so that you don't have to always be in the chamber? Should they? Well, in fact, they have now allowed babies to go through the lobbies. I can't tell you how fiercely that was resisted for a long time. Actually, it was quite nice to see a man be the first person to actually do it. I mean, does Parliament need to rethink its working hours? I mean, do we really need to um, you know, be there in these very antisocial hours when a mum and even a dad wants to get back and spend some time with their children? And let me come back to childcare again and the policies. Because for the first time ever in 2015, this once niche policy area was at the centre of a political arms race between the Labour, Lib Dem and Tory parties. I mean, just think about it. Labour gave us 10 hours free um, childcare. And then the coalition came in and gave us 12 and a half hours. Then they gave us 15 hours. Then Labour promised 25 hours at the election. And then David Cameron, at his manifesto launch, headline policy, we're going to give you 30 hours um, of free childcare. On Wednesday, Jeremy Corbyn, decided to focus on childcare in PMQs, to which David Cameron said, hey, it's us who's doing more for childcare now. I mean, you just wouldn't have dreamt that we would have a situation where childcare would be so fiercely debated between the parties. And look, now we have a Women's Select Committee to scrutinise issues that disproportionately impact on women. But look, things are still really really quite unbalanced and that needs to change because as I've said while many many men care about these issues maybe all men do we even have a male childcare minister I think it's rare to find a man who would call many of these subjects his passion tell me if I'm wrong later and I apologize if I am but I know that I have been to dozens of events around Parliament about things that you might crudely label a woman's issue. And I'm sorry to say that the rooms are always packed full of women. Maybe there's the odd man here or there, but largely women. They are the people who are driving these areas, driving this debate still in Parliament. Now, of course, that does need to change and it will slowly over time. Should I just quickly talk about men? Um, because I do have a view on men as well, as you might guess. Um, I wrote an article recently arguing that the next big step for those of us passionate about equality is to think not about mothers, but about fathers too. Because let's be honest, that old school model, the male breadwinner, 
the wife who looks after the children, it's already broken. Most families can't even afford to do that. So we already need to adapt to a world in which everyone should be able to make decisions unfettered about work and family life. And in that, the role of men is really, really key. Because men have to want to be involved in their children's life and they need to be willing and able to take decisions that might compromise their working lives too. You know, when we talk about my job share, for example, actually there's lots of men who might have benefited from a job share in the lobby. Nearly everyone who is a political editor in the lobby is a parent. There's no reason why just Heather and I are desperate to get home to our children. But look, it's no good offering paternity leave or parental leave if we haven't also persuaded men that they can be viable option. Things have changed. If you speak to younger MPs in Parliament, male MPs, I think they have a totally different perspective to family life than some of their older colleagues. I've certainly heard of one older man in the lobby, I won't name names, who managed a short break when his wife gave birth to their oldest son before quickly heading back to the office. Well, look, when I took my first maternity leave, you know, I knew at least one man locally who took six months off his job as a teacher to spend time with his children. Now, I'm not sure that will ever be the norm, but I'm sure that we can get quite a lot closer to a situation in which men and women are thinking more about how they divide these issues and how they both perhaps think about balancing work and family life. But for now, back to women, we need to urgently think about how to get more women into British politics, more women breaking in to the boys club. We need to think about those practical issues that I was talking about. And we also need to think about more ethnic minorities as well and a wider socio-economic mix. The risk of attracting mainly women from very privileged backgrounds is that our personal challenges may be very, very different to those of people who may be lower um, down in society in terms of um, their economic situation. And actually, we do get criticised as women working in Parliament for focusing too heavily on issues of the elite. For example, the number of women who get onto FTSE 100 boards. In fact, I think some people criticise people who talk about the number of women in Parliament. But I hope that I'm making the argument why it's important. Now, Labour had all women shortlists. A lot of people were very, very negative about that. They say it is positive discrimination and that it is unfair. Certainly, we know that it ruffled feathers. There were lots of local constituency parties who did not want to be forced to hold all women shortlists. There were a lot of men who didn't want to be told that they couldn't apply for their home seat, the place that they'd grown up, the place that they'd dreamt of being an MP. And it's one of the reasons that the Conservatives have not gone down the same path. Instead, they want to focus, as I say, on some of the slightly softer ways of doing it, of training women, getting them into those selection panels at least, so they've got a better chance. But the thing I really object to is people who say it's unmeritocratic to do that. Because if Parliament today is a result of meritocracy, then what we're saying is that meritocracy delivers four times as many men into Parliament as women. Well, I don't believe that. I think that women are just as talented as men. And I think that lots of women are desperate to go into politics and become MPs. I think there are issues. I think there may be issues around confidence. I think, on average, women may feel or express themselves in a less confident manner. They sometimes perhaps don't think that they could be an MP. They don't think that they could be a political editor. I certainly didn't about five weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and they perhaps don't put themselves forward so forcefully. So listen, what I want to say, just to finish off, is that I really think that this can change. I really think that we all have to make a very big effort to improve the number of women, not just in the lobby, but also in Parliament, because I think it will change what we talk about, 
it will change the types of policies that we see come through and I think it will change the tone in which we have that debate. It might even change eventually the way that people behave in the House of Commons chamber. Women are not less talented than, man, than men. If we had a meritocracy, then I suspect 50% of RMPs would be female. Thank you very much.